All right, thanks everyone. Uh, thank you for attending my talk. Uh, my name is Dan. I am a software engineer at Sauce Labs. I've been working on the uh, Appian open source project for two plus years now. And uh, probably my two most notable projects is I've done a lot of work on Appium Desktop. So for those of you who don't know, that's our UI client. And then what I'm here to talk about today is the Appium Espresso driver. <clears throat> So before we jump into discussing the Espresso driver specifically, I'd like to briefly touch on how it is that cross-platform automation works in Appium. So as most people in this audience probably know, Appium implements the WebDriver protocol. Uh, the WebDriver protocol is part of the World Wide Web Consortium, so it's an official standard that will be around for ages. And in the words of the standard itself, it's a remote control interface that enables introspection of control of user agents. So some examples of implementations are a web driver or a Chrome driver, which automates Chrome, and Firefox driver, which automates Firefox. Now, Appium, as probably most of you know already, is special in that instead of just implementing the web browser, it brings, it takes the web driver protocol and brings it to various other platforms. So mobile apps, desktop apps, and possibly more to come in the future. So the question is, how is it that we bring the WebDriver protocol to these platforms? So we have automations for several different platforms, so Android and iOS. Those are the most notable ones uh, and the ones that we support at Sauce Labs. Recently, we got a Tizen driver. That's the Samsung operating system. Windows is supported through the WinApp driver. And U.I TV is also supported, and I didn't include it, but we have a Mac driver uh, automation here. Now, Tizen and Windows are actually special in that they are actually uh, built and maintained by the actual vendors. So that was a pretty exciting new addition to have a na fully native vendor-specific driver. So Tizen was developed by Samsung. Windows was developed by Microsoft. <coughs> iOS and, and Android, on the other hand, uh, we don't have such uh, implementations of WebDriver Agent. Apple and Android don't uh, develop uh, WebDriver um, automations for their devices. So we have to take, the Appium Core team has to take their native um, user interface uh, testing platforms or frameworks, and we have to bring the Appium standard to those. Now, how do we do that? So we, we wrote, write like a sort of wrapper around these native test frameworks. So for iOS, we have the XUI test driver, and included in that is a, a Xcode project we have called WebDriver Agent. We use that to basically delegate to Apple's native XUI test framework. Android, we have a couple of drivers. Well, we have three, but two that are currently supported. The UI Automator 2 driver, which uses Android X.Test's UI Automator 2 framework. And what I'm going to talk about today, the Espresso driver, which uses Google's Android X Espresso framework. So now, it's helpful, so the whole point of having a standard should, it seems like the whole point of having a standard should be, we shouldn't actually, we shouldn't care about what is being used under the hood, like what native framework is being used, uh, because we, like the under, ideally we shouldn't care because it's supposed to hide the implementation details from uh, the tester. So we should just know how to use the WebDriver protocol and we shouldn't care what's under the hood. But anyone who has some experience with Appium knows that uh, it doesn't quite work this way. We try, we try our best to implement it as, as faithfully as possible to the standard, but there's always going to be differences in uh, feature support, differences in performance, and then differences in the ways that the drivers work. And it's quite helpful to understand some of those important differences to write, to help write better Appium tests. And so that's where I'm gonna to talk today. So 
I'm going to talk about the espresso driver. And firstly, I'm going to do a comparison of Espresso and UI Automator 2. So these are the two frameworks that we use that we saw in the previous slide. We'll, we'll do a quick outline of how these two differ from each other and how those differences affect the Appium drivers. So let's give a brief overview of the two. UI Automator 2 is black box style testing. So that means you can automate apps and the device, and you can automate any app, not just the app under test. And they describe it as functional US te UI testing across system and installed apps. And it also has device level operations, so things like toggling the Wi-Fi, pressing the back button, uh, setting the orientation. Espresso is what they've coined a new term as gray box style testing. So gray box style testing framework, uh, it's a functional testing for testing the app under test. And gray box can, can be described as it's mostly black box, except it has access to the internals of the Android application. So this is a bit of a double-edged sword, having it access to the internals because <clears throat> it can actually help the stability and performance of your tests, but obviously it, you're violating the principle of it being a black box testing framework, because ideally we want Appium to be something that models faithfully the way a user uses your application. But I'll, I'll go over now two of those specific features that I think are interesting, and then if we have bonus time, one more. So feature number one, Espresso has the ability to wait for the UI to be synchronized before performing operations. Feature number two, <coughs> it can access elements that are outside of the viewport, <coughs> excuse me, using data matchers. I'll explain what this means and why it's advantageous to testers, starting with the first one, UI synchronization. Espresso waits for the UI to be synchronized before it performs its next operation. What does this mean, and why is this advantageous to us? So to test this, I'll show, let's uh, go over a very basic test case. So for this test case, I want to open up a pop-up menu and select an item. So I have screenshots here. So I want to click the button that says make a pop-up. Clicking that button will cause a menu to open up, and then I want to click an item in that menu. Sounds easy enough. So I'm going to try this really basic Appium script. This is just pseudocode. And I'm going to use UI Automator 2, first of all, first off. So we're just going to locate the make a pop-up button and click on it, locate the menu item and click on it. So I'm just going to run this test here. Let me just mirror my laptop. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so this is the test. Hmm. Oh, one second. Okay, so <laughs> it actually passed the first time but failed the second time. That's the first time I've ever seen it pass. So, but at least I know, we know that it's flaky. So it failed the second time. It didn't find the element. So can anyone tell me why it didn't find the element in the menu item? So element not found exception. Yeah. <laughs> so I kind of, from getting from that, uh, it kind of sounds like the, the consensus was you're all correct that it didn't wait enough time for the UI to render the menu item. I got it. 
OK. So to demonstrate what happened, I'm just going to go over this uh, basic HTTP network chart. So we requested to click the Make a Pop-Up button. We dispatched the button click, and the pop-up menu starts rendering. And the duration it takes to render is represented by the green line. Then we respond with the button click success. So we didn't wait for the UI to finish rendering, because the UI automator test doesn't care what happens after. It just knows the button was clicked. We can respond with success. But then here's what happens next. We request a click on the menu item. And as you can see here, it's not done rendering yet. And it's going to respond with a failure, like what we just saw. <coughs> Excuse me. So the element isn't there yet. Element not found error. So what are some fixes for this? Well, simple solution, just add a delay. So this is the pseudocode solution here. We're going to do the same algorithm, locate the pop-up and menu button, and click on it. Wait for three seconds. So if you're doing Java code, that would be like thread.sleep, which, as we all know, is a code smell. And locate the menu item, and then click on it. So I'm just going to change this uh, ever so slightly. So I won't uh, do the demonstration for it, but I'll just show what would, what does happen is that same thing, request a click, pop up the menu button, dispatch the event, pop up menu starts rendering, respond with button click success. Again, it doesn't wait for the UI to stop rendering, except on the client side now, as represented by this tan line, we've added a delay there that waits until it runs the next command. And then we, requ we request to click the menu item button. And we have success this time. So the pop-up menu is there. We can click the menu item. <clears throat> now, what are some problems with this? Well, how long should the delay be? That's the, the big problem. So we don't want it to be too short. Because if it's too short, we don't give it enough time to wait for the UI to finish rendering. And we're stuck with our original problem. We also don't want it to be too long, because even though it, it may be long enough, if you're leaving too much time in your delay, you're just adding a bunch of idle time to your tests, and you're making your build needlessly long. So you need to find this kind of Goldilocks zone of what the perfect thread dot sleep is. And then throw into it the problem of, what if you have some emulators or devices that are more performant than others? Then what might be an adequate thread to sleep for one uh, won't be adequate for the other. So what's another solution? So another solution is to do retries when locating an element. So the algorithm would look something like this. Locate the make a pop-up button, button and click on it. Try to locate the menu item. If the menu item is found, click on it, and we're done. If the menu item is not found, wait for 500 milliseconds and return to step two. If a certain max number of retries, retries was reached, throw an exception and just give up and say we didn't find the element. So this is, looks a lot better than the thread.sleep proposition. This is what it's going to look like now. So same thing as before, but now we're just going to do a whole bunch of retries to get the menu item until we found it, and we got the menu item, and we're done. So this technique introduces a uh, added problem, though, because as you can see, uh, introducing this fix adds quite a few HTTP requests. So this. In this example here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six round trips. If you're running Appium locally, that's not a huge problem. But if you're running it in a cloud service like Sauce Labs or a Sauce Labs competitor, uh, it won't <laughs> perform as well. Because you're, you're going to be hitting a remote endpoint over and over and over again.
So yeah. And also another problem is we're kind of left with a similar problem of the thread not sleeping that we need to pick an optimal interval period and an optimal number of retries, which again might not be a one size fits all solution for everything. All right, so that was me running the test using UI Automator 2. Now I am going to run the test using Espresso. So the, the test is the exact same. The only difference was I set the automation name to Espresso instead of UI Automator 2. So it works. And then let's try it again so <laughs> we know that it's not flaky. So uh, it worked this time, though. It should work. It's worked every single time I've tried it. And it finished in 11 seconds. So it clicks a button, clicks a menu item. It works. So it always works. What's different about Espresso? versus UI Automator 2, that's uh, allowing this to, to work now. <coughs> so we did it without uh, needing any retries or intervals. So to, to explain what Espresso is doing under the hood, let's look at this again. We're requesting to click the pop-up a menu button, dispatching the button click, and the pop-up menu starts rendering. We respond with success. So it still doesn't actually wait for the UI to stop rendering. It responds with success. But now what we're doing is we're going to click the menu item button. And what Espresso is going to do is it's actually going to wait for the UI to be idle before it performs the operation. So the operation will be blocked until the menu item is ready. And so it sends the success response immediately after. So as you can see, compared to the thread.sleep and the retry interval, this is a perfectly optimal uh, solution because we're clicking the menu item immediately after uh, the menu item has been rendered, there's no delay after, and there's no flakiness, because it'll, no matter how long it takes to render the menu item, it's going to click the button right after it's done rendering. So why does it do this? Well, Espresso does three things that UI Automator 2 doesn't. So you, it waits for three uh, UI synchronization conditions to be met before it performs an operation. So Espresso will not perform an operation until, number one, the message queue is empty. That's some data structure in uh, Android that I'm not familiar with, but I read it in the documentation. Uh, number two, it waits for async task. Any instances of async task that are currently in progress waits for it to finish. Uh, async task is like the like the, I'm a JavaScript person, but I know it's like the, the Java equivalent or the Android equivalent of like a promise. So it's something that waits uh, for a non-blocking operation to finish. So like a network request uses async task. And then thirdly, it waits for all instances of idling resource to be idle. So the first two I won't talk about, but number three, I'd like to go into more detail on those. Idling resource. What is an idling resource? An idling resource is defined from the documentation as an asynchronous operation whose results affect subsequent operations in a UI test. So we can synchronize user interface events in, app in Espresso in our Android applications by registering these operations with the idling resource object. So just to be clear, this, this is a application development uh, data structure. This isn't a thing for writing tests. So this is something that developers actually need to add into their application. <clears throat> uh, 
an idling resource object has two states. Either it's idle, which means Espresso is allowed to run so long as there's no other uh, idle resources, or as a, uh, not idle resources, sorry, and as long as the other two conditions are met. And then not idle, which means that, which means that Espresso is blocked until it becomes idle. So if you have one idling resource object in your Android application, you're blocked from doing anything. Like Espresso blocks from doing anything. So if you have an idle resource, one or more, and you try to run an Espresso operation, Espresso blocks it until that idling resource is made idle. So I think we could better explain this with a coding example. So this is called simple idling resources resource. So this is Java code. So line one, we instantiate the simple idling resource object, and the object has an initial state of idle. Line number two, we set the state to not idle using the method set idle state false. So this means that it's not idle, and anything that happens from now will block Espresso from running. Step number three, we do some kind of UI operations. So in the, the example I used, the operation would be rendering a menu item. So th this is, you can think of this as just any, any UI operation that can't be interrupted, and it's just like a critical UI operation area, uh, should have, be locked by an idling resource. So we do the UI operations, and then we set the idle state back to true, and then that idling resource is no longer, uh, is officially idle again, and Espresso, as long as the other synchronization conditions are met, is permitted to start running again. So anyone who has any uh, experience with multi-threaded programming, uh, this, this pattern actually looks, should look pretty similar, familiar to you. This is similar to how a mutex works. You can think of it as like line number one is it's lock, or sorry, line number two, it's locking the mutex. Line number three is the, the critical area. And line number four is it's unlocking the mutex. And then, so another couple idling resources. There's counting idling resource, which has a default state similar to that of being idle, and then it has an increment and a decrement method, so when the number goes up, it becomes not idle, and when it goes back down to zero, it's idle again. And then we have URI idling resource, which uh, blocks when there's pending network re requests. So what are some of the drawbacks or concerns with this? Uh, well, I said before how the pattern is similar to multi-threaded programming, and there's a danger of your test becoming deadlocked. So if you have an idling resource that never gets released, your tests are gonna be blocked forever. And it requires changes to the app code, which requires coordination between uh, the QA team and the dev team, which doesn't always uh, work efficiently. And then number three, it still doesn't provide a guarantee of UI synchronization. Idling resource, you could possibly mess it up and implement it incorrectly or forget to do it. You may still need to fall back to using retries, but I guess the idea should be that it's something that's there to help you uh, make your test more stable and less flaky. Okay, so with that complete, I am now going to move on to the second of, my of the two features I'm gonna discuss, and that's with Espresso, you can locate elements that are outside of the viewport. So again, I have a test case here. I wanna find an element from a large list, and the element is called search view. So the search, the, the item I'm looking for is outside of the viewport. So it has to scroll down until it finds it and then clicks on it. Uh, 
okay, so let's do another coding example that just, I'm just gonna find the element with the content description, search view, and then click on that element. <clears throat> yeah, so it didn't find the element, and the reason it didn't find the element is because the element we're looking for is outside uh, of the viewport. So why isn't it being rendered? So why, why is the search view not interactable, like even though it's outside of the viewport? Why can't we just, they just render it all? Well, if you look at the mock-up on the left here, I have the list of the menu items and then the view hierarchy. So you can only see everything from animation to game controller input. The search view menu item is the one that we wanna see and that comes, it's alphabetical so it comes way after that. Uh, yeah, so it only, it only renders the visible elements. Why is that? So let's, uh, to understand this better, let's look at how Android's list view object works. So the list view, Android list view widget is an instance of what we call, is an instance of uh, an adapter view. An adapter view is a UI object that has a object, usually a collection of data in memory that represents the entire, <coughs> excuse me, represents the entire contents of that data structure. So list view is a, an adapter view. I think there's like grid view, scroll view, lots of different things. So that, that adapter view will only at a given time display, render and display the items that need to be made visible to the user of your application. And this is what the list view adapters look like. So in this case, so this actually, I, this is a truncated version of what I got from the, uh, the menu view. It's a list of plain old Javis objects that define the attributes of the, the element. So the content description, the title, and the intent. So in my case, there's 11 visible items the rest of the items are not visible. And the item that we want to interact with is in the not visible portion. Why do they do this? Why not just render all of the list items? Well, the obvious reason is uh, performance. The fewer components you render in a user interface, the better performance is gonna be because uh, rendering a user interface is expensive and the more components, the more memory is going to be used, the more CPU is going to be used, so the better the app performs. And so this is, um, this is good for users of the app because they're going to get a better performing app. And this, by the way, this pattern is, uh, you see this pattern in pretty much almost any application design. So iOS, web, uh, yeah, it comes up all the time. So it's good for the users of the app, but bad for the testers of the app because there's no easily way to locate elements that are off screen or outside of the viewport. The solution, if we were to use UIDomator 2, is to scroll, use a scroll action that scrolls through the component, scrolls the element in the view, and the algorithm will look something like this. Try to locate the element. If we find the element, return the element. If we do not find the element, scroll down, and return to step one. If we've reached the bottom of the scrolling, then we just give up, throw an exception, and say we didn't find uh, the elements. It's kind of similar to how retries work. So I'm just gonna show another 
uh, coding example here. So it's scrolling, scrolling, it found the element, clicked on it. And that took 21 seconds. So it works, it's a pretty reliable method. So what are some problems with this fix? Well, likewise, a lot of extra HTTP requests, similar to how retries work, a lot of HTTP requests to perform the intermediate scrolling operations. So that case, we scrolled like three times. If you have a really long uh, component, it could scroll uh, dozens and dozens of times. Well, it could, no matter, depending on how big the component is, it could just take forever to scroll. So that's lots of HTTP requests. And that's lots of uh, different scrolling events. So it's lots of multiple scrolls instead of one smooth scroll. So ideally, it would be nice if we could just, instead of having those janky multiple scrolling events, if I could just scroll to that item in one smooth uh, motion. <coughs> also, there's potential flakiness. So maybe we have a large device that we don't need to use a scrolling uh, technique on, and uh, our tests work without scrolling, but then when we try on a smaller device, it breaks. And yeah, yeah there you go. So that's where Espresso comes in. With Espresso, we can write locators that actually target the adapters instead of the actual views themselves and we automatically scroll them into the viewport. So this is the object we want to target here. So if you remember from before the list of adapter items, we want to target the Java object, so not the view, but the Java object within the adapter that has the title, I have it in bold here, search view. How do we do this? So. So this is an Espresso example. So this uses the Espresso framework. It doesn't use Appium. So this is independent of this. Espresso has a thing called on data or data matchers that are you, and they use Hamcrest matchers. Ham, Hamcrest matchers are Java matchers that are used to uh, target objects. So it's like a querying uh, strategy for targeting Java maps or strings or just any, any kind of collection of objects, it'll target an element or, or an object or multiple objects. So in this case, we have a Hamcrest matcher that looks like this. So we want to find one that's an instance of map.class. So these are all maps. These are, this is just um, a readable representation of the Java map. And then we want one that, this is Hamcrest here, has an entry where the key is title and the value is search view. So this is, this is how Espresso works. This is how Espresso does it. As I said before, Appium delegates, the Appium Espresso driver delegates to Espresso. And we now have a data matcher selector that can actually use that. So here's how the new data matcher selector looks. So here it is in uh, kind of a JavaScript-like code. So find element using hyphen Android data matcher. And then we take, we have a format that takes the uh, Hamcrest matcher and you represent it in JSON format. So you get, provide the name of the method and the arguments. In this case, the arguments are title and search view. So as you can see, side by side, these are basically equivalent with each other. They do the exact same thing. So this JSON object gets sent over the wire. 
the Espresso server receives it, unpacks it, executes the Hamcrest matcher. So now what we're gonna do is I'm going to run the same script that we did before without any scrolling, but we're gonna use a different selector this time. So here's what the script is gonna look like. This is JavaScript. We have the data matcher. We find the element by data matcher. Click on the element. So running the script again, you'll have to pay attention closely because it happens pretty quickly. So you see there, it clicked on the element. So it actually, if you, it happens pretty quickly, but if you notice, it does one really quick, smooth scroll. So it scrolls to the element that we want to click on, just did one operation instead of doing multiple scrolls and then checking, it's just one fast scroll. And if you have a look at here, the times, so with UI Automator 2, it was 21 seconds. Now with Espresso, we've reduced that number to 13 seconds. And on top of, on top of that, uh, so let me just, being more performant, it's also less flaky. So it's a less flaky way to doing it because you can target uh, the views on just any screen resolution and uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, it doesn't matter like if it's a large screen or a small screen, the data matcher will find elements that are in or outside of the viewport. Okay, so I think I'm gonna blast through this pr last section pretty quickly so I can do a question period. How do we write these data matcher selectors? Well because you won't have access to the source code. Espresso source has an object called adapters, which contains the list of adapters that you can apply the Hamcrest matcher to. And so you can just cut and paste that from your adapter, so you can either dump that in your console using driver.source, or you can do an inspection session. You can inspect uh, your app in Appium Desktop, and you can cut and paste it from there as well. So that you can use that as your basis for writing data matchers. And so in conclusion for this, why should we use data matchers? Well, so number one, I, I talked about performance already. It's also less code. It's just, it's one uh, data matcher. It's one selector that scrolls to and finds the element. Scrolling is done automatically, so you don't need to write that. It's a lot faster, as we saw. So. UI Automator requires multiple scrolls, and then a locator request, so that's multiple round trips. This is all done in one HTTP round trip. And uh, yeah, it's less flaky as well, because scrolling, there's a risk of, if you do the scrolling yourself, there's a risk that you could scroll past an element and then never find it, or there's a risk that you could be finding an element uh, on a larger screen, and it works on a large screen, but then it doesn't work on a smaller screen. So screen size and resolution don't matter. Okay, so any questions or comments? I know it was a five minutes left. Yeah, I have to, I'll have a bonus section if there's if we get through this quickly though. So any questions? Yeah. What we uh, if we have a big amount test that we are already using UI Optimator two. Is it easy actually to switch into the Espresso or there is a like big rework? Uh, um, I mean, there, there are some incompatibilities. So the biggest incompatibility, and actually what Raj Deep here is talking about in the next, or actually no, you're talking about the back door next. Yeah, so you can't act, the biggest incompatibility is with the Espresso driver, you can't uh, access apps outside of the app under test. So if you have system apps that you need to be automated, that won't work. But otherwise, it's, it's mostly compatible. Thank you. Yeah, but I can't promise it's gonna be a, a seamless cutover.
Hi, actually, I was asking whether uh, if we have a custom view, would that be more uh, like expressive? Would be effective in that also? A custom view, uh, as long as it's an instance of an adapter view, yeah, it would you'd be able to use that. So it doesn't have to be a view that's a native to the Android component library. As long as it implements adapter view, then it'll work. Thanks. You're welcome. Questions? My name is Suresh. So I have two questions to ask. One is on the long list. Let's say we are in the middle of the list and the element like the item which we are interested to look is at the top. Will Espresso be able to find out? Yes, it will. So it doesn't matter if it's inside or outside of the viewport. It'll find the element. So the direction doesn't matter. It can scroll up and down, which wherever yeah. the... That's right, yeah. So if you've scrolled down already, it'll scroll up to, to find the element. Uh, okay. at, the, at the beginning, so it doesn't matter where it is. Okay, and then the second thing is like, let's say we have a huge list of products and these products get rendered as we scroll. So in this case, does let's take an example of a HTTP request where we make a request and we get the list of items. In the screen, let's say we have some four items displayed. As we scroll up, the next set of elements get rendered. So does Espresso handle this case as well? I don't think it would handle that because uh, if you're loading, that yeah. would mean you're loading the data remotely. Yes. So it's not going to have uh, an adapter until the data actually gets loaded. There, there's a possibility maybe if you have like an infinite scroll that loads some of the adapter data ahead of time, you might get um, you might get pretty f like further down the list than like outside of the viewport. But if the item hasn't been downloaded yet, yes. then yeah, you, you, won't, you wouldn't be able to access it. No. Thank you. You're welcome. More questions? Hello. Uh, I just want to ask that uh, in our application, uh, you have so many recycle views. Is it counted as adapter as well? Is, sorry, what was it? Recycle views. Recycle views. It's Android uh, views. Android fields, what about? Uh, a few, a few. Recycler view. Recycler oh, view. Yeah. yeah. So that actually is, we, we don't support that yet. So these are adapter views. Yeah, recycler views, I'm aware of those. We don't support that yet in Espresso. Uh, I am aware of those that, Espresso, the framework has a way of handling recycler views, but we haven't implemented it yet. So, but there is, uh, that's okay. a possibility. Okay, thank you. <laughs> 